day 456, regen, abilities, doing what? Oh! How's it going, everyone? Don't worry about that. Today, what we're going to talk about is actual paralysis and how it could possibly be overcome with sort of like a recentish breakthrough in treating it. And this has taken what we thought about the human nervous system and turned it on its head if the preliminary results are anything to measure up with how the actual future of this technology will go. And just as like a personal note, this is an exciting prospect for all those who were injured in life and have lost the ability to move. So let's discuss this possible workaround and learn a little bit more about what makes us capable of movement and how we may be able to increase the quality of life for those confined to wheelchairs for the remainder of their lives. So recently it was discovered that nervous system stimulators could be used to possibly overcome paralysis in individuals, coupled that with physical therapy. Attaching the stimulator to the spinal cord inferior to where the damage actually occurred allowed individuals to move toes at first, and then their legs, and then in some cases they were even able to get up out of their wheelchairs. One man in particular after being injured in a dirt bike crash was confined to a wheelchair for presumably life after physical therapy yielded no results. Another man was actually paralyzed due to a snowmobile accident in 2013 and remained paralyzed after three years, but then he was equipped with a stimulator and was able to walk with assistance. But before getting to like the meat and potatoes of this breakthrough, what exactly is a spinal cord stimulator and what is it used for? When people are in great amounts of pain, this stimulator can actually be used as sort of an overload. With the electrical signal also activating the local nerves, any incoming information of pain can be lost in the noise and your brain will receive much less information on how you are actually currently suffering. So your nervous system reports incoming information and relays outgoing movement. That said, your body doesn't just report to your brain, but also to the, I guess you could call it, second brain. This second brain is known as the spinal cord. To keep it simple, when you feel anything in your environment, nerve signals run from that basically area of the skin that you touched and then go through the nerves towards the spinal cord. Here, the spinal cord then reports that information to the brain. But it's not always that type of route. Let's say you touch something hot. You'll quickly move whatever is touching that hot thing away by command of the spinal cord, not the brain. And this is the important part. This shows that the spinal cord has the ability to control movement to some degree without reporting to the brain. The reason for this is that for the signal to travel all the way to the brain, be interpreted, the brain actually collect enough neurons together to get a movement signal back to the spinal cord, that travel down the neural pathways, and then you finally move, a lot of cellular damage would take place in this time. So the spinal cord picks up the slack sees you are in pain, and then quickly moves the limb away from whatever is causing the damage. And I'm not really sure how interesting that you find the spinal cord being an almost thinking part of you, but that absolutely blows my mind. The generalized thinking is that the spinal cord is really more of a bridge with some autonomic functions, is that it's actually made up of large collections of neural tissue, just like your brain. So, I mean, if you think about it that way, why wouldn't it be able to remember things and react to things much like how your brain does? All right, but let's get to why we are actually here the conquering of paralysis for those afflicted with this terrible ailment. As you progress through life, you tend to get better at things. We call it muscle memory, and while things like that does exist, that really has more to do with the actual nucleus of cells being uh, donated to the muscle tissue, or at least muscle cells, and that's kind of how you grow muscle faster, but we'll get to that probably in a later video. But what is actually like real muscle memory, I guess you could call it? Things like riding a bike, which supposedly you never forget getting better at things that you practice more growing up, becoming more fluid and learning a sport, or getting really good at Titanfall 2 to the point that you can almost predict where people will be through an arc and adjust accordingly. So from what it seems, it appears that this information while in your brain, which is basically how you learn and quantify data, which you sleep and then you wake up the next day and you know math, it may also be stored within the connections of the spinal cord itself. When you sever the link between your brain and a section of the spinal cord, it was assumed that everything that lay on the other side could not be communicated with ever again. However, this whole dynamic changed when a spinal cord stimulator was attached to the injured side of a person's spine. With the electrical signal being provided by the stimulator and the person was told to think about wiggling their toes or the act of walking, their limbs actually began to move after years of paralysis. This seems to suggest that the spinal cord itself is what's responsible for our walking to a large degree. So this means that the spinal cord, even with its damage, is not just a useless piece of neural tissue, but instead 
is still quite capable of receiving and transmitting information to the muscles. It should be noted that no sensory information was taken in and transmitted to the brain during this trial, so effectively they are still paralyzed concerning feeling, but movement to some degree was restored to them. What's more interesting is that as they continued to go through physical therapy, their movement got better and more fluid until one man was actually able to stand at his wedding with some assistance from rails around him. This means that the spinal cord was actively learning and may have been actually learning how to pick up fine-tuned movements, whereas the brain, because it was no longer able to handle this work, meant that it was reliant upon the spinal cord. And I know I'm nerding out over this, but the implications, while still in its infancy concerning testing and research, could be huge. This has the potential to change how we actually view our bodies and how we operate. For instance, if our spinal cords are capable of remembering how to walk, then does this really mean that the brain just sort of influences how we walk and makes it more natural and smooth, which specifically comes from the cerebellum? And if this is the case, why does thinking about walking, even with the damaged spinal cord severed, allow them to walk to some degree with the exciter? Does this mean that connections could possibly still be in place and can be used? Or does this mean that we think with our spinal cord as well? But anyways, what this all seems to suggest is that our brain really acts more as an exciter than an executor of function, at least concerning walking. This is based on the fact that when the exciter was shut off, all movement in the subject's paralyzed limbs ceased and they returned to their complete lack of movement, even when thinking about moving. Because of this, it can be assumed that the brain perhaps sends a bulk electrical signal to the spinal cord, and as it moves through, the thought of walking, which may actually be in the spinal cord, can be activated with the brain's signal. In this scenario, it would appear much less like a bridge and more like a partnership, which perhaps is how we should approach the spinal cord-brain relationship in the future when addressing paralysis. And I mean, it would really be like any other damaged part of your brain, however, it may still be possible to have that piece of your brain communicate with the body, even though it is not able to communicate with other portions of the brain anymore. I look forward to the future and continue to watch the progress on this exciting possibility for all those who are paralyzed. Again, it should be noted that this is not a fix for paralysis. That technology is still a ways off. But if we can help those regain mobility and independence, that would drastically increase quality of life. And as we begin to understand more about the connections that our bodies make, if one side of the bridge can be repaired, then possibly the other side of the lanes can also be fixed to start receiving incoming information. But I wanna thank you guys for watching. I will link the actual article in the description if you'd like to read more on that. It's fairly interesting. Uh, like and subscribe if you enjoyed and you are new. I know I'm still actively posting on this channel. It's just my main channel takes up the bulk of my time and you know that's kind of how I pay bills and stuff like that. This is really, I suppose, more of a pet project, although I absolutely love it. And I'm really glad you guys are enjoying the channel as well. Anyhow, that does it for me, and I will see y'all in the next one.